Threads of History, a podcast that aims to go back in time to connect an event or instance to its origin through several threads of continuity across time, space, culture, and historic moments. Welcome to the podcast. I am your host, Mike Shellhammer. Today's episode is asking you to question your senses. Are you able to identify what that odd noise was when your house is empty? Many people look to religion to find comfort that their recently deceased loved one is granted eternal rest. But what if that isn't true? What proof can we find of the afterlife? Humanity's interest in spirit communication is as old as human existence. Humanity has been attempting to commune with the dead since ancient times. As far back as the Book of Leviticus, the Old Testament God actively forbade people to seek out mediums, although they didn't stop the king of the Israelites, Saul, when he summoned the spirit of Samuel through a medium. There is a curiosity and wonder about what life is like when life ends. Does it continue in much the same way? In 1814, David Ogden, a minister at Yale University, wrote this in response to the question of whether the existence of ghosts or specters were possible and verifiable. Quote, It is somewhat remarkable that the appearance of specters should, in all ages and in all countries, be an object of belief. We can't tell what methods God may take to make beings of another world visible. He certainly has made angels visible. Unquote. This subject was not uncommon in the minds of early Americans. Ogden represents the curiosity that Americans held regarding divine intervention, ghosts, and communications with spirits of the dead. So why not communicate with the dead? What were religion, prayer, and folklore all talking about, if not the supernatural, spiritual, and weird? Out of this curiosity came spiritualism. In its most simple form, spiritualism is a philosophical movement and a set of beliefs which had adherents seek out communications with the dead through mediums, seances, or similar means to gain some sort of knowledge of the metaphysical. Why did spiritualism become such a phenomenon during the mid-1800s? First, we need to look at the two previous centuries. The 16th and 17th centuries in America were dominated by the Puritan form of Christianity, so named due to their focus on pure and absolute morals. Anyone who practiced anything like spiritualism during that time would have been risking their life. And an example of even a whiff of witchcraft Just look for the 25 men, women, and children who died due to the panic that led to the Salem witch trials. It is estimated that thousands of people were executed for witchcraft in Europe during those centuries, and America was kind of late to the party. Life was very rural, harsh, and rigid in America. People were held to very strict mores to deal with the perils of what was considered normal life. However, America was drastically changing by the mid-1800s. There was more industrialization and urbanization, which meant cities were growing and work was evolving. Inventions and science were transforming how people looked at the world around them. Immigrants were bringing in new religious practices and beliefs into American towns. There was literature and scientific discoveries that challenged religious beliefs in the Bible. America was on the verge of a civil war, and tensions were high. People were looking for assurance because life seemed uncertain. Another big factor for the rise of spiritualism was that people were not as comfortable or as comforted by traditional Christian beliefs when their loved ones died. The death of children, well known on the frontier, led parents to seek comfort in other places besides their community church. Spiritualism offered grieving people solace, 
while coping with their loss. All of these factors helped create an opening for spiritualism and beliefs in spiritualists to rise. In 1848 in Rochester, New York, the birth of spiritualism came in the form of two sisters, Kate and Margareta Fox, aged 11 and 14, respectively. They relayed some strange experiences to their parents. The two sisters heard knocks on furniture and walls while in their bedrooms at night. It was put forth that the knocks were the communication of a spirit, and the sisters decided to try to communicate with it. They would ask questions, and noises seemed to come in response. Everyone was mystified by these young girls' abilities to speak to the dead. Through their questioning, they determined that they were communicating with the spirit of a man whose ghost still resided in their house. In the weeks that followed their first encounter, neighbors would frequently visit the Fox household to have a chance to communicate with the alleged spirit. Through their newfound mediumship, the Fox sisters helped their neighbors interact with it. Through weeks of investigation following this script, the sisters discovered that the spirit had been murdered and buried in the cellar by one of their neighbors over a dispute worth $500. All took it as the gospel truth. Although the body was never found, and it could never be verified that the event actually took place. An unverifiable story didn't stop the Fox sisters. In fact, Maggie and Kate would be joined by their older sister, Leah, and they spent their lives working as mediums, beginning with their first public demonstration in 1849. They were invited to do demonstrations and hold seances where they communicated with the dead across the state and then eventually across the country. You could call that a successful venture for these ladies, making money from truly, genuinely communicating with the dead for decades. However, the sisters had a falling out as adults, which led to Maggie coming forward in 1888 to claim that it was all a hoax. She revealed that the very first spirit communications in their New York bedroom were a prank. They had discovered this quote-unquote skill when the sisters attempted to play a prank on their parents by tying apples to a piece of string to create the illusion of a spirit or the, the wrappings of a spirit, they called it the wrappings, the knockings. And so what the parents perceived as these wrappings of an alleged spirit were only simple knocks of fruit controlled by the sisters foots, foots, feet, foots, feet, feet. Maggie said at their public demonstrations, they would use their own knuckles, joints, and toes to make the familiar raps and knocks they had become accustomed to conjuring. A year later, Maggie recanted all of this. So 1889, she said, oh, it, it, I, I'm, I was just kidding. It wasn't actually a hoax. It's so common, though. People do that. Just like they're afraid of the truth, and they finally say the truth, and the chickens come home to roost. That's a pretty decent way of describing it. And then they're like, oh, wait, no, I was just kidding about that time. But Maggie recanted all of it, but her reputation as well as the reputation of her sisters was damaged beyond repair. After decades, it didn't much matter what Maggie had said. Reports of their interactions with the ghost in 1848 were published in newspapers across the country, thus beginning the phenomenon of spiritualism. The movement gained a large following, which ranged from political leaders, advocates of reform, religious leaders, and a mass of typical Americans who sought to connect with a world that they once believed was unobtainable. Despite the way things ended for the Fox sisters, their contribution to the spiritualist movement was profound and undeniable. Their work as mediums led many others to take up the profession as well, which led to the growth and popularity of spiritualism, not just as a movement of belief or phil uh, philosophy, but as a bona fide religion. Spiritualism as a religion was a mixture of liberal, nonconformist values and fireside chats with dead people. Spiritualism attracted some of the greatest thinkers of their day, including the biologist Alfred Russell Wallace and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who spent his later years promoting spiritualism in between knocking out Sherlock Holmes stories. 
People across the country flocked to mediums and seances to see the attractions that spiritualism provided. Within the seance room, a medium could summon up any spirit who they thought would bring the most revelation to their participants. They stared in awe at the tables that were rising from the ground and shaking, the intense knockings coming from the walls, and the medium who would become possessed by the spirit whom they summoned and spoke in their voice from beyond the grave. As said before, invention and science were factors in the popularity of spiritualism. Some even saw spiritualism as a scientific religion. So a lot of these new technologies were being used to support spiritualist beliefs. The invention of photography played into spiritualism beautifully. This brand new technology fascinated and terrified people at the same time. Photography allowed us to see what we were unable to see from our own perspective and at a different time. Photographs taken from hot air balloons gave people their first aerial images of towns and cities. Civil War photographs showed death and destruction on a scale that few had ever seen in person. It was disconcerting to see a snapshot of a different person at a different time, whether they were alive or dead. Not to get into a too long tangent, but the invention of photography being so new, uh, many people didn't have their photographs taken very often. I think the number right now, you know, people taking photographs of themselves and their food and any number of things, putting it on the internet, putting it on Instagram, putting it on their snap story, putting it on TikTok, your image is out there like a thousand times more than what it would have been a hundred years ago, maybe even 10,000 times more. You know, I've got more photos of my kids from certain days of their life than I've got pictures of ancestors of mine. And that's just from one day. And we take so many photographs today, many photographs, as I just mentioned, the idea of them being dead or alive, you know, kind of like a, a snapshot of life or a snapshot of death, a snapshot of time. Many people in the 1800s ended up having their only photograph uh, whenever they were dead. And uh, for, you know, babies that would die or young, they would prop them up with their parents, you know, just get one photo. Sometimes the the photographer would do like a little bit of a primitive Photoshop and they'd paint on the eyes. I don't want to get into too much of it, but photography and uh, like what it's called deathbed photography or uh, waking dead, something like that. It's living, living dead. No, maybe not. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting stuff. If you want to be a little freaked out, you know, Friday the 13th, maybe you know Halloween, you know, a good time of year to get yourself a little freaked out. Look up, you know, early photographs, people being photographed while they're dead. And you'll see these people sometimes having their eyes drawn open, you know, drawn on so that they look like they're alive. But you can tell something's off and it's off because they're they're actually dead. And, you know, some of it's sad, you know, like, you know, I'm a father. And so, you know, to lose a child would be heartbreaking. And so to know that you only have one photograph of your child because your child died at like three months old or six months old or two years old, at least you have that. At least you have that snapshot, that memory. And this was something very new for a lot of people because of this new technology of photography to have that sort of snapshot. Otherwise, you'd have to have, you know, a portrait made and portraits were incredibly expensive. So uh, it's an interesting little dive if you guys want to take the time to look up uh, photographs of people uh, in the early days of photography uh, where there are photographs that's not them. They're, they are unalive. They are, they are not alive. One of the other sort of quirks of photography at this time is that they were producing photographs that made it look like there were spirits that were revealed in these you know scientific processes when we we're capturing images on paper uh you had photographer he was a spirit photographer known uh william h mumler 
and he was active during this time period, mid 1800s. And he produced portraits that had ghostly images in the background or near the person being photographed. Uh, former First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln was one of Mumler's clients, and she visited him after her husband's murder. And his photograph of her had an image of, of course, Abraham Lincoln standing behind her with his hands on her shoulders. I can argue, and, I, and I'm sure you could agree, that this was a scam, of course. Uh, but it, it didn't much matter. It, it didn't much matter. You know, it gave many people comfort to think that their dead loved ones were near them, even when they couldn't see them. Uh, these pictures were published in newspapers. Spiritualism benefited from these photographs, despite critics and despite proof that these pictures were manipulated. Prior to the American Civil War, when a loved one died, the family handled the process at home, and the dying would be surrounded by family and friends. You had a wake, and you had a funeral, and they were held in homes, not in a funeral home, but in people's houses, allowing people the chance to grieve together as family, to grieve together as you know a community. The American Civil War changed that for hundreds of thousands of families. It's estimated that 750,000 men died in the Civil War. And so those hundreds of thousands of families were, were one, unable to be with their loved ones whenever they passed. They never saw the body, and so they lacked a lot of closure with that. Death on this scale hadn't happened before in the U.S., so this great loss and this immense sorrow, so many families... And it contributed to the rise and the appeal of spiritualism. Spiritualism gave someone a chance to speak to their loved one or to hear from a medium that their loved one was at peace. You know, you had that chance at a message. And so this was a great comfort to grieving people. The Fox sisters may have been the beginning of spiritualism in America, but Emma Hardinge Britton was the religion's biggest advocate. Emma was born in England in 1823, and from a young age, she demonstrated talent as a singer, a musician, and actress. Her first trip to America was for a role on Broadway in New York City, where she met spiritualist Horace Day. This changed the trajectory of Emma's life. She became a spiritualist and began work as a medium and trance lecturer. One of her most famous spirit communications was with a deceased sailor, who had died when his ship had sunk a few weeks earlier. Emma knew details about the ship and the sinking that only someone with first-hand knowledge should know. At least, that's what people thought. During her life, she traveled extensively in America, Britain, Australia, and New Zealand to promote spiritualism, and she used her many talents to do so. She wrote books on spiritualism and was considered the leading historian on the subject. Her writings included guides on how to conduct a seance and how to investigate mediums for fraud. Emma was a born entertainer, and so she used these skills during her demonstrations and her lectures and her seances. She also used her platform as a spiritualist to share her views on slavery, her views on the poor, and women's rights. Her work and her philosophy created the foundation for what we could consider modern spiritualism. Even some of the leading scientists of the day believed in spiritualism. The English physicist Sir Oliver Lodge, whose work was key to the development of the radio, was one of the chief purveyors of spiritualism in the United States. The creator of the syntonic tuner, which allows radios to tune into specific frequencies, Lodge saw the seances as a way of tuning in to messages from the spirit world. You had Thomas Edison, infamous inventor, Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. So you had a lot of communications devices sort of people getting into uh, un trying to understand what it meant to have a communication across worlds, you know, across the through the veil of death uh, from the living to the dead or for the dead to the living. So they uh, these guys were experimenting with tools for spirit transmissions, not just, you know, real transmissions. And so they viewed them as the next natural evolution of communication technology. Seances were another method by which to try to connect to the dead. They were a huge spark of spiritualism. A huge part. 
huge part of spiritualism. You've likely seen the typical seance on TV, uh, but more on uh, ghost hunting and seances and that connection to TV in, in a bit. We'll hear more about that at the end. But you've likely been, you, you can describe this scene you can imagine it. People sitting around a table. It's a dark room. Likely there aren't any lights on at all. Maybe some night vision. They're holding hands. There are spooky noises that fill the air. You might even have the table levitate or knock against other people. Maybe, maybe the medium, the person leading the seance gets possessed. Uh, this is actually much like what happened uh, during the typical seance in Victorian America. Some that wouldn't normally believe in spiritualism may still take advantage of the abilities of mediums and their seances, trying desperately to communicate with a recently lost loved one. People truly wanted to believe a medium could connect with the spirit world. Unfortunately, many unscrupulous people use seances to con people out of their money, which is something that's still happening even today. Many mediums were exposed for their fraud, but it didn't stop the popularity of seances. The reason that so many mediums could conduct fraudulent seances was mainly because there was no electric light at this time, or at least it was not available until much later in the spiritualism craze. Rooms will be lit by oil lamps or candles, so the scene is perfectly set for clever trickery in rooms with low light, or they'd just do it in complete darkness. Participants might even be encouraged to keep their eyes closed, so it's so you can hear the hear the spirit communication more easily. You know, keep your eyes closed. They would be told not to touch the medium or any spirit summoned because it could kill the medium. So this was an easy way to deflect any attempts at physically touching the spirit to prove their identity. There would be uh, noises. A spirit might manifest, a quote-unquote spirit. Uh, there would be tappings on people's shoulders. Many mediums had accomplices to help them create these ghostly noises and manifestations. Some mediums used specially constructed cabinets that could produce music or allow their accomplices to come and go during a seance. The oil of phosphorus would be used to make things glow in the dark. Victorian seances were a source of entertainment for some, but for others it was hope of or proof of scientific advancement for recognizing, understanding, seeing the afterlife, communicating with the afterlife. Once electric lights and handheld lights were available, those who conducted fraudulent seances needed to look for other ways to entertain their audience. Some of these methods would still be practiced for decades into the early 20th century. And in fact, this is here. This is where they run afoul of one of the most famous illusionists in American history, Harry Houdini, and involve another celebrity. And I've already mentioned him. Uh, he's from Scotland, the creator of the famous sleuth Sherlock Holmes. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. In 1920, two of the greatest celebrities of their era met for the first time. It would become the first of many meetings at correspondence for years afterward. Conan Doyle and Houdini were an improbable pair. Conan Doyle was a Scottish Victorian gentleman, a famous author, and educated at a Catholic private school when he was young. Houdini was largely self-educated. He was a Hungarian immigrant to the United States who had spent most of his life on a vaudeville stage. The two men were brought together by a shared interest in ghosts, spirits, the afterlife, and the supernatural. They were especially interested in spirit communication and the common method for contacting the dead we just mentioned a moment ago called the seance. Maybe I should have... One of you guys count up the number of times I said seance in this podcast. English theater director Hannah Edenow is fascinated by Conan Doyle, who believed he saw the faces of the dead, including the face of his own nephew in a photograph taken with a cenotaph. Quote, There is something interesting about the way he was always so convinced by the evidence of his own eyes. Theater is all about directing the eye and where people look. It's about controlling what people see and don't see, unquote. 
that photograph uh, that he claimed had the face of his nephew in it was la later proven to be a fake. Many 19th and early 20th century mediums used many theatrical techniques. So very much about the control here, what people see and what people don't see. What is the so-called spirit cabinet used by many famed practitioners like the, uh, the Davenport brothers, but it's just a form of puppet theater. And so it, it's a theatrical element, a theatrical technique. It's not about actually being able to communicate with the dead. It's about tricking people. Following the death of his son Kingsley during the First World War, Conan Doyle became a devout believer in life after death and an untiring missionary for the spiritualist cause, donating the equivalent of millions of dollars in today's money in trying to prove that the dead were all around us and eager for a chat. Houdini, the showman and illusionist, longed to believe that he might be able to communicate beyond the grave with his beloved mother, but knew far too much about the trickery and the faking of the stage to be easily convinced. Early in his career, before he found fame as an escape artist, Houdini and his wife Bess were not above drawing on their own theatrical skills to give public seances on the vaudeville circuit. Immigrant life in America was hard, so if that was the way to ensure there was bread on the table, Houdini did what he had to do. I don't blame him. Conan Doyle, a medical doctor, he was the creator of the great rationalist, you know, Holmes, might seem like an unlikely person to fall for the claims of mediums. But from the mid-19th century onward, spiritualism had a widespread, widespread following in the UK. Uh, and so that rise coincided with the Industrial Revolution and a period of great technological and science, scientific advances. And maybe the fact that we had these new technologies bring on more and more change, uh, the more and more that we looked for, or that they looked for something that was beyond, something that couldn't be explained. And so that was something that spiritualism helped to bring them. The huge loss of life of the First World War only gave spiritualism more converts. Public seances in the Albert Hall and other huge venues were common, and the appeal of the movement cut across all classes and types of people. Rudyard Kipling's sister was a society medium. And while Conan Doyle might have been teased in some quarters uh, in his belief for the authenticity of things like fairy photographs, those are called the uh, Cottingley Fairies. It was in Yorkshire. Uh, but Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his claims of an afterlife and having a direct conduit between our world and the next were respected and treated with respect, uh, including uh, from members of the media. Conan Doyle's own wife, Jean became a self-proclaimed medium and the purveyor of automatic writing. And I'll explain a little bit about automatic writing later on. At their Sussex home, they had their own personal spirit guide called Phineas. Uh, no, no word on the if there was a Phineas uh, and a Ferb here, but Phineas. Uh, he regularly predicted global catastrophe, which sounds wonderful. Phineas uh, also dictated when the Doyles should move house or when they should travel. Uh, in a book uh, called Houdini and Conan Doyle, Friends of Genius, Deadly Rivals, Christopher Sanford recounts an occasion when Jean got the local station master to reschedule a train that her husband was due to take based on the advice from Phineas. Uh, the council of Phineas, it appears to be, it appears that it quite often jived with the desires and interests of Jean herself. So it's kind of like using Phineas in order to get what Jean wants. So with Houdini and Doyle being the friends that they were, Houdini would sometimes feign more openness about spiritualism than he truly possessed though he did seem genuinely in search of a real medium. So they had become pretty good friends, um, but they remained diametrically opposed to each other on, I'd say, most of the subject of spiritualism. Or you might argue that 
uh, Houdini thought that there was, you know, too much fraud in spiritualism, but there might be something real out there. Whereas Conan Doyle just believed everything. And of course, he believed his own wife. So that's all playing into it. Uh, one instance in which uh, Houdini and Conan Doyle sort of had a, uh, I suppose you call it the falling out, a, a little bit of a falling out, was in 1922. Conan Doyle's wife, Jean, uh, scribbled out during a seance 15 pages of perfect grammatical English. And this was claimed to be from Houdini's mother. And apparently this rubbed Houdini the wrong way. And so uh, Houdini had looked over the pages and he promptly dismissed them. And not least because his mother's English had been terrible. Apparently she didn't really uh, learn much English, uh, having immigrated to the United States later in life. But she most definitely did not uh, draw a cross atop each page of the message to her son uh, because she was devoutly Jewish and the wife of a rabbi. Conan Doyle and Houdini's friendship uh, became more strained uh, after this point, and Houdini's private opinion of Conan Doyle's spiritualist belief morphed into more public disagreements. Uh, the men spent years waging a cold war in the press, you know, not actually addressing each other. Uh, they'd go on lecture tours and they'd even have Houdini testify before Congress. Houdini's opinion of Conan Doyle was actually preserved in the hearing transcript. He called Conan Doyle one of the world's greatest dupes, which um, is rough. So you'd, you'd have to argue that at that point, they were not friends anymore. While Houdini, by his own estimate, investigated hundreds of spiritualists over a 35-year span, his participation in one investigation dominated international headlines in the years prior to his trip to Washington. In 1924, at the behest of Conan Doyle, Scientific American offered a $2,500 cash prize to any medium who could produce physical manifestations of spirit communications under very stringent test conditions. Scientific American were acting sort of as investigative journalists. They had actually unveiled a lot of hoaxes in their time. So the magazine formed a committee of eminent scientific men, including psychologists, physicists, and mathematicians from places like Harvard, MIT, and other top institutions. The group also counted Houdini among its members as a guarantee to the public that none of the tricks that Houdini might be familiar with would be practiced upon that committee. Scientific American regularly covered spiritualism as an interest of science. Many well-respected scientists, uh, including uh, before I mentioned him before, Oliver Lodge, Sir Oliver Lodge, uh, he was a magazine contributor, and so he was a vocal defender of the practice's legitimacy. While in the U.S., Conan Doyle contacted Scientific American's publisher, a man by the name of Orson Munn, and suggested that instead of covering psychic work as an ongoing debate, they ought to take a stance on it. And Munn agreed. Munn and the magazine's editors decided that the best way to determine their stance would be to hold that contest I just mentioned, which was refereed by this committee of several scientists, and then you had Houdini. The contest promised to use the latest scientific tools to ascertain once and for all whether there were true connections to the spirit world found in the current spiritualists or not. This equipment included things like, quote, induction coils, galvanometers, electroscopes, some with the purpose of testing the electrical conduction of the medium at the moment when phenomena are produced, others to prove the presence or absence of material objects, unquote. The psychic tests initially performed in the magazine's library got off to a slow and rocky start. Many of Conan Doyle's most revered mediums refused to appear in a public competition. I wonder why. Contestants who did show up were quickly dismissed by the judges as tricksters. Houdini was said to have muttered, quote, I never saw such awkward work in my life, unquote. 
that awkward work went on for more than a year. Then news began to emerge about a medium in Boston who did not take money for her seances and who seemed to have no particular motive for being a conduit for the dead. The woman's name was Mina Crandon. Uh, She was married to a respected surgeon, and she did not want publicity, unlike the other mediums the magazine had encountered. And she actually went, went by a pseudonym, so you might hear her name as Marjorie Crandon. So an editor and some of the contest judges set off to the Crandon's residence on Lime Street in Boston for some preliminary visits. Bells rang in the dark, uh, a Victrola played without explanation, and the voice of the medium's dead brother conversed with observers. Her performance, if a deception, suggested a magician's talent rivaling Houdini. While slumped in a trance, her hands controlled by others, Crandon channeled a spirit that reportedly whispered in the ears of seance sitters. Uh, and pinched them, and poked them, pulled their hair, floated roses under their noses, which is a fun little rhyme, and even moved objects and furniture around the room. The contest's chief organizer, who who Dini criticized for being too cozy with Crandon, apparently she was a little more scantily clad in these seances. I, I, I didn't find photos. I, I Should I be embarrassed that I looked? I, I just, I looked to see. Because it was considered to be, oh, he's a little too cozy, probably because she's, you know, she's smoking hot or something. And, you know, it was 1920s. She looked fine. But the contest organizer, the chief organizer, didn't actually want Houdini there. He declined to invite the magician to the early seances uh, because of his tough scrutiny. And so it threatened to upset the symbiotic relationship between the medium and the committee. Uh, Marjorie could not convince Houdini uh, whenever he actually did. He was able to show up and he was able to examine her, her shtick, her, her seances, you know, her show. And so fearful that his scientific American would award Crandon the prize over his insistent that insistence that she was in fact a fraud. Uh, You had Houdini preemptively issue a 40-page pamphlet titled, Houdini Exposes the Tricks Used by Boston Medium Marjorie. (laughs) So he kind of like got in front of the story to make sure that Scientific American couldn't award her the prize because of this cozy relationship and the chief organizer. I'm not sure if that was Munn or he wasn't named in my sources. So I'm not sure who was so cozy with Crandon, but um, they didn't end up doing it. The scientific American committee uh, would eventually after over a hundred seances, they reached the same conclusion as Houdini. And this was much to the chagrin of Conan Doyle and his supporters in 1925, the magazine announced the Marjorie uh, Crandon case was over. Houdini and Conan Doyle's relationship barely survived the committee. Uh, Houdini increasingly denounced mediums who Conan Doyle was convinced were utterly genuine. And because of this huge rift, the relationship simply broke down. It is notable, however, that even after the difficulty with the Marjorie Crandon case, that the Scientific American did not end its search for genuine spiritualist mediums. It kept that committee going. And as late as 1941, it still sought out the truth. They even upped the prize to $15,000. The magazine seemed unconvinced that conclusive evidence would surface on either side of that debate. Uh, The issue in 1943 said as much. Uh, Houdini would turn to other avenues in pursuit of exposing fraudulent psychic mediums after his his work with that committee was finished. Described by the Washington Post as uproarious, the 1926 congressional hearings on spiritualism marked the culmination of Houdini's all-consuming mission to put fake mediums out of business. When he arrived in Washington for the congressional hearings, Houdini found a city steeped in spiritualism. At the May hearing, Rose Mackenberg, a woman Houdini had employed to investigate and document the practices of the local mediums, detailed an undercover visit to spiritualist leader Jane B. Coates, testifying that the medium told her during a consultation that Houdini's campaign would be pointless. Coates was said to, to ask, quote, 
Why try to fight spiritualism when most of the senators are interested in the subject? I know for a fact that there have been spiritualist seances held at the White House with President Coolidge and his family. Unquote. In his testimony, Houdini exhibited the skills of a litigator and a showman, treating the House caucus room to a master class on the tricks mediums employed. It takes a flimflammer to catch a flimflammer, he told the Los Angeles Times, citing his early vaudeville years when he dabbled in fake spirit communication. At the outset, the magician stated his case plainly, quote, This thing they call spiritualism, wherein a medium intercommunicates with the dead, is a fraud from start to finish. Unquote. Flimflammer is such an old-timey term, I love it. Houdini's use of street smarts to hold America's leading scientific authorities accountable inspired many of his followers to similarly debunk spiritualism. Houdini declared that highly educated men were sometimes simply just easier to dupe. Remigius Weiss, a former Philadelphia medium and a witness supporting the illusionist at the congressional hearing, further explained the vulnerabilities of scientists' thinking. Quote, they have built up a sort of memory, and they treasure it like the gardener with his flowers. When they come to these mediumistic seances, this theory is in their minds. With a man like Mr. Houdini, a practical man who has ordinary common sense and science at his disposition, they cannot fool him. He is a scientist and a philosopher. Unquote. For Houdini, a man who'd made a living suspending disbelief with skillful, innovative illusions, spiritualist mediums transgressed both the ethos and the artistry of his craft. Houdini rejected others' claims that he himself possessed supernatural powers, preferring the label of a the mysterious entertainer. He scoffed at those who professed having psychic gifts, yet performed their tricks in the dark, whereas further insult to his profession. This is just further insult, insult to his profession. He, they, they transgressed, as, as, he, as I mentioned in, uh, a second ago. It took less skill for a medium to conjure things with the lights out, so they didn't even have to be skillful at it, uh, is uh, what Houdini had said. Worse still was the violation of trust, as the troubled or grief-stricken viewer never learned the spirit manifestations were all bogus. Houdini had more respect for the highway robber, who at least had the courage to prey upon victims out in the open. In trying to expose frauds, however, the magician ran up against claims that he was infringing upon religion, a response that illuminates rising tensions in 1920s America, where people increasingly turned to science and rational thought to explain life's mysteries. Involving leading figures of the era, the ramifications of this clash between science and faith is still happening today. It's still happening. It's science says this, but my religion says that, and what are we going to teach in schools? In his efforts to expose frauds and spiritualism, Houdini employed the same tricks of the seance out in the open, like putting a flared end of a long spirit trumpet to the ear of a congressman, where he whispered into the tube to illustrate how mediums convinced seance guests that spirits had descended into the darkness with them. Houdini also showed legislators how messages from the beyond uh, could mysteriously appear on spirit slates and the fact that they could be co concocted in advance and then concealed from the view viewer and later revealed uh, all through uh, that a little bit more skillful, but sleight of hand, uh, just making sure that they, you know, keep things out of out of place or you know swap things out, just through sleight of hand. The crowd listening to Houdini's, Houdini's testimony included fortune tellers, spirit mediums, and astrologers who came to these hearings to defend themselves. They couldn't all fit in the room. They were hanging from the windows. They were sitting on the floor. They were in the corridors. At the e as the Evening Star newspaper reported, quote. The House caucus room today was thrown into turmoil for more than an hour while Harry Houdini, psychic investigator, and scores of spiritualists, mediums, and clairvoyants had verbal and almost physical battles over his determination to push through legislation in the district prohibiting fortune-telling in any form, unquote. Houdini failed to appreciate that Americans cherish the freedom to be fooled. 
His own contempt for mediums began with his professed hope that some might prove genuine. The fact that none did, he said, did not rule out the possibility that they true medium did, true mediums did exist. Houdini also took pains to point out that he believed in God and an afterlife, which are both propositions others might argue also lack. Science advanced in Houdini's time. Many did not care to have their spiritual beliefs probed by scientific instruments. They did not believe it was the province of science to validate their beliefs. In fact, theologian G.K. Chesterton in a 1906 essay, Skepticism and Spiritualism, said of the two disciplines, quote, they ought to have two different houses. Modern people think the supernatural so improbable that they want to see it. I think it so probable that I leave it alone. Unquote. Maybe Houdini was being cruel to be kind when he told people, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle included, that they were being deceived because he thought grief was making them susceptible to charlatans. He wanted spiritualism to be true, but he found no evidence to support it. And so he couldn't stand by and just say nothing. Houdini died less than six months after the conclusion of the Washington hearings. Houdini was just 52 when he died on Halloween in 1926, succumbing to perit peritonitis caused by a ruptured appendix. He'd aroused so much antipathy among spiritualists that some observers attributed his mysterious death, or I guess sudden death, to the movement's followers. The magician had received threats to his life from those implicated in his investigation of fraudulent mediums. Walter, a spirit channeled by Marjorie Crandon, once said that Houdini's death would come soon. Psychic Madame Marcia, in true charlatan form, claimed in a magazine article penned long after the illusionist's passing that she had told Houdini he would be dead by November when she saw him at the congressional hearings. No one corroborated that statement, of course. Famous in life for his improbable escapes from physical constraints, the illusionist promised his wife, Bess, that, if at all possible, he could also slip the shackles of death to send her a coded message from the beyond that he would do so. Bess held a yearly seance, hoping that her husband might make contact and give her the message using that prearranged code. Basically, they had a code word uh, to make sure that no one could deceive the other in their time of grief. But he was always a no-show. It's actually a great idea. I think uh, I'm going to do this with my wife. If I die young, I'm going to have a code word <laughs> so that she knows if she ever goes to somebody to try to make contact or uh, somehow uh, something happens. She's going to know it's me if this specific thing happens. Can't just be any random thing. And so no matter how much they, they asked and how different ways that they asked in these seances yearly, Halloween of all, to, of all days, uh, Bess would try to make contact with Harry. And so in 1936, she gave up. Supposedly, she declared, quote, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. Houdini did not come through. I do not believe that Houdini can come back to me or to anyone. Unquote. Perhaps a Halloween seance can still honor Houdini's legacy of skepticism. Famous skeptic and author Joe Nickel had hosted Houdini seances for over 20 years. Apparently, he only stopped a few years ago. No one in attendance at these seances actually expected Houdini to materialize. Instead, the gatherings acted as an important way to remember Houdini and his skepticism towards spiritualism and mediums' claims of contact with the dead. Perhaps Houdini would be honored that admirers are still marking the anniversary of his death after, you know, almost 100 years now. Uh, I'm not sure, though. Maybe he'd be mortified because they're remembering him in the form of a seance, and he was there to debunk all of those. Conan Doyle and Houdini never mended their friendship uh, before his death. It is not known if Doyle ever tried to contact Houdini by seance, but I'd actually like to think that he did. Uh, if only just to mend their fractured friendship. It actually makes me sad uh, that he had, um, that they weren't able to sort of mend fences there uh, and be able to be friends again. But, you know, sometimes people disagree so strongly with something they believe or something they don't believe that 
you, you can't come back to that. You can't come back from that. You don't have enough in common anymore or enough important things in common anymore. There's no denying that the rituals of the seance and the medium were opening up insights into the mind, shedding light on the power of suggestion and even questioning the nature of free will. But as we mentioned before, sometimes people just want to be fooled. I feel like I'm quoting the Christopher Nolan movie here, uh, The Prestige. Uh, it had lots of magicians in it. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. It's from like 15 years ago. Uh, but it does seem like, psychologically speaking, people might rather have supernatural but unverified contact with the dead, especially the recently departed, than no contact at all. Like, there's a comfort in that. And knowing that if the worst were to happen to you, that you'd survive somewhere else on a different plane of existence, and that you might even be able to contact the people that you cared about in your previous life. Whether fraud or genuine, the abilities of the mediums in Houdini's day are openly on display today by various talented illusionists and performers. The tricks and techniques used by mediums have been exposed many times by people seeking to show their skills, uh, by people such as James Randi, Darren Brown, and John Dennis, the creator of the Bad Psychics website. Another one of these techniques uh, used by today's mediums, uh, other than the seance is what I mean, uh, is called cold reading. I actually took a class on the psychology of paranormal beliefs, and I have a, a like a pamphlet, a how-to almost on cold reading. It's it's pretty interesting. Once you know how it's done, then it actually makes me want to try to do it. But also, I'd feel kind of bad <laughs> if people started believing that I had abilities. Uh, of course, I don't. Uh, and, but the cold reading, it's the use of probable guesses and picking up on cues to steer the medium in the direction of a profound or secret truth only known by the, the person seeking out the medium, by the mark, by the audience. Uh, so here's an example. If I went to a medium today and she would likely ask questions and quickly gauge my answers to see if she was right, like she'd look at me and my reactions, uh, they're really good at, uh, they would or should be really good at reading body language. So if she hit on something that, or she didn't hit on something, it was a dud. Uh, for instance, the suggestion that she was in the presence of a 40 year old uncle of mine. Uh, she could quickly widen that out. Uh, the 40 year old person, well, they're not actually 40 years old. Maybe they're young at heart of some sort, or they, uh, 40 is an important number for them. And then when someone who is more of an uncle figure, it doesn't have to be a blood relative. So suddenly the thing she says is that there's a 40 year old uncle of mine that's dead with her. And that can't possibly be true, then, well, 40 is a different number. It means something else. An uncle isn't necessarily a blood relative. Maybe it's someone that's kind of like an uncle or has the energy of an uncle. Uh, and they all say that kind of stuff. They, they use those terms, especially in cold reading. A medium today could also be skilled at the Barnum effect, um, named for P.T. Barnum, of course. The use of statements that tend to be true for everyone, though we would not really ever think of them. Uh, consider this. Is there someone in your life that you were close to who has died? That's a pretty easy hit because for most people going to a medium, you have to you have to be at least like a teenager. And given enough years, everyone has someone that they're close to who's going to die. It's just the reality of, of life. The reality of life is death. Oh, sort of morbid there. I apologize. Uh, among dozens of these guesses and misses and hits, it's possible for the medium to convince you due to a bit of confirmation bias. Uh, it's a common bias when we as humans are searching for something. It's We tend to find it when we search for it, uh, but that might not be representative of the wider availability of that item or uh, the wider uh, instance of those things or that event. You know, You look for an earthquake and you think every day there's an earthquake. Um, that might be true depending upon uh, what metric you look at and what science you're looking at. But it doesn't mean that they're more prevalent or less prevalent today than they used to be. Uh, not only that, but we're prone to ignore evidence to the contrary. So we search for evidence of a conspiracy, let's say about the Kennedy assassination. You're bound to find thousands of websites that claim to have the truth without 
much evidence at all, if any, uh, before you find the actual rather mundane but well-researched Warren Commission report on the Kennedy assassination. Professor Richard Wiseman, a psychologist and magician, says people tend to remember the correct details in a seance, but overlook statements or events that provide no evidence of paranormal powers. You've already overcome the biggest obstacle to the medium's powers in that you've already committed your time, your energy, and money towards belief in that medium's powers. What's next is your sunk cost and natural response to wasting money in that uh, you don't want to waste money. Never, ever, 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 ever waste money. So you don't want to waste that money. So whatever insight you can glean from a medium must have had value and maybe even the value that you actually paid for the medium. There's no harm in paying for something that's worth it, right? So a lucky guess or a Barnum effect statement, then it's considered to be a successful session. Wiseman's work has shown that we are all extremely susceptible to the power of suggestion. With colleague Andy Nyman, a co-creator of Darren Brown's Television Illusions, Wiseman used contemporary descriptions of Victorian seances to recreate an encounter with spirits in a old prison. Over eight seances involving 152 people, volunteers sat around a table in the dark holding hands while luminous painted bells and balls and maracas moved before their eyes. Surveyed afterwards, a fifth of the volunteers believed that they had witnessed something paranormal. Here's what Wiseman had to say, quote, These things are often very simple. We had a man creeping around with a stick. We thought when we read the original accounts of how seances were carried out that they wouldn't fool anyone. We were wrong. A lot of this has to do with framing. Once you think you have an explanation for an event, you don't have any other ones. Once you think it's a spirit, you don't look for another explanation. Unquote. During these reenacted seances, Nyman, taking the role of the medium, announced that the spirit would raise the table. Soon afterwards, he encouraged the spirit by saying to lift it higher or that the table is moving now. Two weeks later, a third of the participants recalled wrongfully that the table had moved. It's not so effective if you inquired directly after the event, but weeks later, it's easier to plant a false memory there. The trappings of the seance increase its success. Holding hands prevents participants from disrupting any of the trickery. Darkness increases sensitivity to sound and movement and make people more scared which may also increase their susceptibility to suggestion. Our visual cues are all off. So we might swear we hear, we see movement or we hear something when there's nothing there or when it's suggested to us, we will say that something's happened or something's moving or something's being said. The seance can be explained by stage magic and human sensory organs. Uh, but what about the phenomena like table tipping and the Ouija board? Let's dive into this. Table tipping or table turning has gone out of fashion, but it's easy to replicate with four or more people, a small table, some dim lights, and a chill vibe. The group place hands on the table and then they wait. <laughs> Which I don't know what you talk about during this time, but anyway, 40 minutes or so are going to go by and the table is going to start to move. It soon appears to have a mind of its own, sliding, swaying, and even pinning people against the walls. It's, this is true. This actually, they think it's this happened. Uh, the reason why household furniture can appear to be possessed in this way was exposed more than 160 years ago by Michael Faraday, the discoverer of the link between magnetism and electricity. In 1852, Faraday was fascinated by the new craze of table tipping and whether people or spirits were responsible. So he took bundles of cardboard roughly the size of a tabletop and glued them very weakly together. And so each sheet got progressively smaller from top to bottom, allowing Faraday to mark their original positions on the card above with a pencil. He then placed the cards on a table and asked volunteers to put their hands on the cards and let the spirits move the table. 
This experiment allowed Faraday to see what was moving the table. If it was spirits, then the tabletop would slide out the cards from the bottom up. But if the participants were doing it, the top cards would be the first to new first to move so like the top slides it would be because the people have their hands on it and they're moving it as opposed to a spirit moving it somewhere down below and so ex by examining the position of the pencil marks that he had he could show that it was the people moving the top rather than a spirit moving the table some other way uh, he had demonstrated the idea motor response idea motor response the movement of muscles independent of deliberate thought. So this is a little bit of a freaky thing. This also explains table tipping's more opaque and mystic cousin called the Ouija board. In a Ouija seance, participants place fingers on a glass on a table surrounded by letters and watch as it eerily moves and occasionally spells out words in response to questions. Psychologist Susan Blackmore is best known as the proponent proponent of memes, but early in her career, she was a parapsychologist. At Oxford, she ran the Student Psych Psychical Research Society, carrying out experiments using Ouija boards. Time and again, the glass spelled out words and sentences, and you might call her a believer, but then she used the scientific method to debunk these movements. She simply modified the board. Blackmore would describe these changes. Quote, we turn the letters upside down because surely spirits should see the letters underneath. And of course it's spelt out rubbish. It cannot work unless all the people can see what is going on. Unquote. I love the Brits whenever they say rubbish. The idea motor effect is also at play with this case. Uh, the glass of the planchette of the Ouija board. When the glass moves, you naturally adjust your movements and go along with the glass. You simply can't keep your arm and fingers barely touching anything for too long. To get it to start moving, it moves mm, very hesitantly. But after a while, as soon as it starts moving, everyone ha everyone's hands just follow it naturally. That explains the movement, but what about the spelling? Blackmore proved that the letters have to be on top. Why is this? So this was investigated way back when American psychologist Joseph Justro in the 1890s. And so this was at the height of spiritualism. So he used a device called the automatograph automatograph. I think that's how you pronounce it. Automatograph automatograph. And so it's made of two glass plates separated by brass, uh, like ball bearings. Any involuntary movement of the hands placed on the top plate caused the glasses underneath to move. And so that movement was recorded by a pencil attached to this device. And so when Jastro asked volunteers to imagine looking at an object in the room, so just to imagine looking at an object, not actually looking at it, but imagining that they're looking at it, the automatograph revealed that their hands involuntarily moved in that direction. Just visualizing the door was enough for the hands to drift towards it. And so that's what's happening with a Ouija board. If the participants look at a particular letter because they expect it to follow up next, they unwittingly nudge the glass towards it. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy since you know how to spell. So you spell out words that you, as you expect them to go. If all the participants were blindfolded, which is actually another experiment I've seen done, I, I can't give you the experiment name because I don't remember it, but this has happened before where you blindfold all the participants. Once again, rubbish spells out rubbish spells out nothing. It, it, they end up it ends on places where there aren't actually letters. If the Ouija board had shed light on uncontrolled movement in our hands and our unconscious spellings, Another technique for channeling spirits has questioned our free will. Harvard psychologist Dan Wegner is best known for his work on the rebound effect. Tell someone not to think about white bears and they immediately think about white bears. There's actually another line from another Christopher Nolan movie, uh, this time called Inception, where uh, the character played by Joseph Gordon-Lovett says, don't think about elephants. And the character played by uh, Ken Watanabe says he's thinking about elephants. He's like, I tell you not to think about elephants. What are you thinking about? 
he says elephants. <laughs> so the more we try to suppress a thought, the less likely we are to succeed. Uh, it's kind of like the end of Ghostbusters. So lots of references here. This this episode, I apologize. They're all they're all good. They're, they're all good, good places. Go watch these movies. They're all very important. Uh, the original Ghostbusters, uh, when they have to clear up their minds, it's not possible for too long. Uh, it, you can't clear up your mind entirely. You'll end up thinking about something. It doesn't matter what you think. About. You have to think about something. So Dan Wagner investigated automatic writing. And so this is where people claim to write without being aware what they are doing. And so this is what Jean Doyle was doing uh, whenever she was trying to channel Houdini's mom is she was kind of letting her hand go limp and just letting the, the words come to her. Uh, I imagine the, the spiritualist uh, view on this or the spiritualist uh, method of automatic writing was probably a little bit more, more deliberate at this point, because you could just sit there and say, well, that she's possessed and she can just sit there and write out a whole bunch of this message saying that, Oh, it's coming from this, this other person where she's just thinking things up as she goes along. The most famous automatic writer was Pearl Curran. And she was an American who knocked out more than 5,000 poems, novels, and plays. Jeez. Uh, while claiming to be channeling the spirit of patience worth, who was a 17th century English woman. I'm willing to bet that she doesn't exist or at least evidence that she existed uh, is not forthcoming. Automatic writing has traditionally been explained as the action of the subconscious mind, but Wegener argued that the reason lay in the illusion of free will. Most people have a sense of their inner person, the conscious self that makes decisions about your day-to-day -day life. According to Wegener, this sense is an illusion. There's evidence to back up this idea, in fact, you had in the 1960s, uh, neurophysiologist William Gray Walter, uh, he got volunteers to operate a slide projector while their brain was monitored with electrodes. The participants were told to press a button to change the slides. The button was a fake, though. The button was a fake. The projector was controlled by electrical activity in the brain. So the startled volunteers found that the slide machine was predicting their decisions. A fraction of a second before they decided to press the button, the part of the brain responsive for hand movement burst into activity, and because the electrodes were monitoring it and communicated that to the slide projector, it moved the slide onward before they were able to press the button. Uh, Gray Walter showed that there was a fraction of a second delay between the brain making a decision and someone being aware that they were making a decision. This actually comes up in uh, a class that I teach on psychology. Uh, that is this, this is a theory that people have for deja vu, uh, a potential uh, origin for deja vu, and that we don't know we're making the decision and we don't know that we're thinking the thought uh, consciously as quickly as we are making the thought. But a realization of that then makes you think that, oh, I've thought this thought before. And really, you haven't. In the 1980s, Benjamin Leibert of the University of California, San Francisco, made a similar discovery after attaching volunteers to electrical motors and sitting them in front of a screen displaying a dot in a circle. The participant were, were told to the participants were told to flex their wrists whenever they liked and report the position of the dot at the moment they made the decision to flex the wrist. Again, there was a surge in brain activity uh, a fraction of a second before the volunteers were aware that they were making a decision. Wagner's solution was that our deliberate thinking brain, the inner me that makes decisions, is an illusion. Instead, the brain does two things when it makes a decision to raise an arm or to press a button. First, it possesses, it, it passes that message to the part in charge of creating the conscious inner you. So that's a delay, a very, very short delay, but it does happen. Uh, and that signal going to the arm or going to the hand, going to, you know, press a button, it's a fraction of a second. So that delay generates the illusion that a conscious mind has made a decision. Ever heard of someone being so good at a sport that they can anticipate the play? Uh, it's as if that conscious part making decisions is just cut out entirely. It, and that's what they think is happening with automatic writing. 
Wagner argued that automatic writing occurs when the brain sends the signal to the arm to write, but it doesn't really stop to alert the inner conscious you about that decision. And there's actually something a little ironic about this conclusion uh, from Wagner. Uh, the early spiritualists believed that they were shedding light on this transition of the human spirit from the physical body into the afterlife. And so Wagner suggests that it's not just a distinction between mind and body, uh, but it's the whole concept of a conscious decision-making mind. It, it doesn't actually exist. The brain's doing this stuff with without our consciousness actually needing to be there. Uh, and 150 years after Faraday showed that table tipping was bogus, we continue to be frightening one another in the dark. Wiseman, which is a great and an apt last name, has this to say about that. Quote, what is remarkable is that the stuff written in books 100 years ago still works. If you think of all the technology and science and education, and yet a group of people sitting in the dark can scare the living daylights out of themselves, unquote. Speaking of scaring each other in the dark, we can finally get to the final topic of today's episode, the ghost hunting craze on TV. I can say with pride that I've watched probably too many ghost hunting shows. Uh, I have at least a dozen DVDs as evidence of my fandom. And so where did all these TV shows come from? There have been over 140 television series about paranormal happenings, psychics, mediums, and ghosts since 1969, though the lion's share of those came after the year 2000 when the reality TV show on MTV premiered. Uh, it was called Fear or MTV's Fear. I was actually able to buy this reality TV series on DVD sometime back in college. It followed young adults around a supposedly haunted location where they were recorded via night vision cameras and stationary security cams while they attempted to complete challenges like doing summoning rituals, putting on a noose, uh, sitting in an electric chair. It was a short lived series, only having about two seasons, uh, 16 episodes total. But it was widely acknowledged for launching the genre of ghost hunting that is popular now 20 years after it aired. Everyone is familiar with this premise now. Instead of a simple tech, uh, the simple technology of spiritualists, the tables and the maracas and the Ouija boards, you've got spirit boxes now. You've got full spectrum cameras. You've got infrared. They're all looking for subtle changes in the environment in order to detect ghosts. We have night vision cameras stationed on top of an X and Zach Bagans yelling at dark air. It's entertaining. I, I, I watch a bunch of them, so I, I really am entertained by them. In many ways, these shows do try to help people, uh, whether it's offering a solution to their environmental torments, a scapegoat for their unexplained happenings, or a support for their beliefs in the afterlife. In a similar way to those who during spiritualism's heyday wanted to connect with their departed loved ones, people today might seek out ghost hunting shows and ghost hunting groups to obtain some form of closure. Uh, it's a way to say goodbye, a finality to someone's life that was tragically cut short. Even when many of these shows go to historic sites and not actively lived in environments, for the people watching at home, seeing more quote unquote evidence for the afterlife can be comforting to them. Uh, I mostly watch for the stories and that history. Uh, my wife says that we need to make a bingo card for ghost adventures uh, because they tend to be so formulaic during their investigations, but it, it makes sense uh, how, uh, how they operate. You know, Have any ghost hunting shows been able to give definitive proof of the afterlife? I'm not sure they have. Uh, it, it's tough. Uh, some of the evidence is pretty compelling, but then... Other evidence uh, is either debunked or somehow just not really compelling enough. And so just like Scientific American and their contest, can we say for sure one way or the other on this subject? People who claim to contact the spirit world provoke extreme reactions. For some mediums, they offer comfort and they offer some mystery in a dull world. For others, they are fraudsters, they're unwitting fakes, they're exploiting the vulnerable, they're exploiting the bereaved. Whatever they may have been, we can draw a line from the Fox sisters 
to the mediums and fairies that duped Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, to Houdini and his push for truth, and to the myriad of ghost hunting TV shows that feature on streaming channels today. Thank you for listening to this episode on spiritualism and ghost hunting TV. This has been Threads of History. I was your host, Mike Shellhammer. Thank you for listening. You can email your comments and suggestions to threads.historypodcast at gmail.com. Listen to more Threads of History wherever you listen to podcasts. Seriously, it's kind of hard to keep up, but if you're listening to this uh, on your chosen platform, all of my other episodes are also available here. So come back and listen to more Threads of History.